thanks for the reminder to record. All right, so we are talking about chapter five, just mostly section eight is what we're gonna be focusing on today. A little bit of interphase, but then also in chapter eight or section five. So um, on the slideshow for today, we're gonna to be looking at slide number, uh, slide number eight, and then slides number 28 to the end. So eight and then 28 to the end of the slideshow. And so that corresponds, if you're following in your textbook, um, roughly to page, um, page 137 is a description of one part of it. And then when we skip over to slide number 28, then we're gonna skip over to page 143 of your textbook. All right, <clears throat> so we're talking about cell cycle and cancer today. And what is cancer? Well, this is a disease where the cell cycle is out of control. In other words, cells are growing and dividing at a very uncontrolled rate. Usually they're growing and dividing too fast. Now, why does that happen? Well, that happens because there is a mismanagement in how the cell cycle is regulated. So before we talk about that mismanagement, let's talk about how the cell cycle is supposed to work. Remember that the cell cycle has two parts to it. There's interphase and there's mitosis. These two phases are not equal in length. If you remember this diagram that we showed at one time or that we drew out one time, we, sell, we said that um, interphase is most of the cell's time, very little of the cell time is actually during mitosis. So if we were to divide, divide this in a 24 hour day, this would be approximately about 90 minutes. And this would be the other 22 and a half hours of the day. If we were dividing this into a 24 hour day. So all of this would be interphase. But interphase itself is divided into G1 S and G2. Let me make this clear. If we divided it into a 24 hour day. It doesn't mean the interphase actually takes 22 and a half hours. It's just a comparison of how much time we actually spend in it if we were considering it to be like a 24 hour day. <clears throat> so most of the time the cell is an interphase. Now, historically, before our microscopes were as advanced as they are now, historically, we used to think the interphase was a time of rest. The reason that we thought that is because when we looked at the events of mitosis under the microscope, those events were very exciting. You could see changes with the microscopes that we had at the time, even at something as simple as you know, 400 times magnification, you could see some definite changes in the microscope and the uh, nucleus of the cell. Our microscopes at the time were not powerful enough to see what was actually happening during interphase. And our instruments and our tools and our techniques, they also were not developed to the point that we could tell what was happening during interphase. After our instruments, our tools, and our techniques got better, we realized that interphase is actually a very busy time. There's a lot of stuff happening. It's just that the appearance of the DNA during interphase is different than what the appearance is during mitosis. It's a very exciting looking, but that doesn't mean that nothing's happening. When we have gone back and looked to see what is actually happening during the events of interphase, we realized <clears throat> that the cell is busy doing either basic life activities or it's getting ready for mitosis. So when we look at the three stages of interphase, G1, S, and G2, their names literally come from how we were able to observe things happening during interphase. <clears throat> what we realized when we looked at G1, S, and G2 is that we realize that the S phase, and I'm going to talk about these out of order, the S phase, which is the middle stage of interphase, 
during S phase, this is when DNA replication occurred. So the time before DNA replication and the time after DNA replication, that was just referred to as gap stages where we weren't sure what was happening, but we knew that DNA was being replicated. Later, scientists determined that during the gap phase before DNA replication, or what we call the gap phase one, cells were busy doing basic life activities. Cells that enter the gap phase one, if I look at my diagram, have just finished mitosis. So these are new baby cells in a sense. And so they are physically small and they're gonna have to go through a period of physical growth to get a little bit larger. And all of the things that they have to do during that time period um, is dedicated to supporting their physical growth. So that means that they're gonna be very metabolic. They're gonna be breaking down lots of sugars and protein molecules and other in order to provide energy that they need to grow physically and to do other things such as replicate organelles. They need to make new mitochondria. They need to make, if they're plant cells, they need to make new chloroplasts. Um, they need to make new endoplasmic reticulum. They need to make all of those internal cell parts uh, for those new growing cells. So after gap phase one, the cell goes into the S phase or the synthesis phase where the cell dedicates its attention to its genetic material. And this is when the cell is going to make a copy of every single piece of DNA that's in its nucleus. When that stage is over, then the cell enters gap phase two, the period of time after its synthesis. What's important about gap phase two is that a cell that enters the G2 phase is referred to as being committed. And committed to what? Well, committed to mitosis, meaning that a cell that enters gap phase two eventually will divide. So during gap phase number two, the cell spends its time making final preparations for mitosis. <clears throat> After the G phase two, of course, then we go into the mitotic phase of prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. We've already described what happens at those stages quite a bit, so I'm not gonna review them other than to remind you that this is the mitotic phase. And then the cell cycle starts all over where the cell goes back and enters G1 again. So this is why we call it a cycle because it starts over and after we finish telophase and cytokinesis. Now something about interphase, and I'm gonna draw it out here on my second sheet of paper, I'm running out of room. <clears throat> Something about interphase. So as I've explained, we have the G1, the S, and the G2 phase. There is an alternate to the G1 phase, and that is called the G0 phase. So if I'm looking at my diagram of the cell cycle, G1, S, G2, and then mitosis, back to G1, there's an actually an alternate called the G0 phase. There's an alternate to that, the G0 phase. Um, G0, this is basically permanent G1 phase. It's permanent G1 phase. <clears throat> and what I mean by a permanent G1 phase is that the cell is going to continue to do all of its regular life activities, but it's never going to move on to S phase again. So you have daily living activities. But the cell never will progress to the S phase and to mitosis again. So sometimes you will see on a diagram or you'll hear G0 
it's basically permanent G1. It just means that the cell has finished its prescribed number of cell divisions. So how do we know, or how does the cell know <clears throat> when it has reached its number of cell divisions? You know, in other words, what controls this? What controls this? Well, one answer is the length of what are called your telomeres. Way back at the beginning of the class, we watched a video with Elizabeth Blackburn and she talked about pond scum and how pond scum that she was studying. <clears throat> um, one of the things that they noticed about it was that it stayed young. It didn't matter how much time passed, telomeres in that were involved in this idea of this pond scum, pond scum basically staying young. Well, telomeres, in case you don't remember, these are the ends of chromosomes. And there's no real DNA of any interest in these telomeres. So there's no genes. And I'm going to draw my telomeres in a different color here. It's in a sense, it's junk DNA in that we don't use it to code for anything. So the ends of your chromosomes, those are your telomeres. There are no coded genes in this area of the chromosome. Scientists believe that the purpose of the telomeres is to act like a protective cap on the end of the DNA that we do use. So it protects the DNA from damage and what we call degradation or breaking down. An interesting thing about the telomeres <clears throat> is after you undergo mitosis, your DNA stays the same length, okay? Your DNA stays the same length, but your telomeres get shorter. So something interesting about telomeres <clears throat> is that they shorten with every mitotic division. <clears throat> so long telomeres are a sign of youth. Short telomeres are a sign of aging. We do know that there are things that can cause our telomeres to shorten without cell division, but basically young new DNA has long telomeres and old DNA has short telomeres. So one of the ways that cells know that they have reached the limit on their number of cell divisions is the length of the telomeres. When the telomere length have reached a short stage, we know that we don't want to divide anymore. So one thing that seems to send cells into G0 is telomere length. 
G0 is not a terrible place to be. Okay. Many of your cells are in G0 already. So like, for example, you have a lot of brain cells that are busy working in your brain right now, <clears throat> but your brain cells are not actively dividing. Some of them are, but your neurons, your nerve brain cells, they are not actively dividing. You have <clears throat> the brain cells that you have now are the brain cells that you've had for probably the last 15 years of your life. They have never divided since they have reached a particular stage of maturity. So in other words, those brain cells, their telomeres are short, and that's telling the rest of your body that those cells are never going to divide again. How long are those brain cells that are in G0, how long are they going to last? They're going to last until your last breath. So you're going to have to take care of those brain cells because some of them, if you lose them, they will not be replaced. That's also true for some of your muscle cells as well. So think about your organs that are very muscly, like your heart, for example. There are certain cells in your heart that make up certain layers of muscle tissue. When those cells came into existence, like when you were being formed within your mother's womb, those cells came into existence and they never divided again. All they've done is they've grown physically larger as you age. But if you lose those certain heart cells, they're not going to be replaced because their telomeres are too short. Oh, there's a nasty fly in here. <clears throat> there are other cells, however, that their telomeres link does not seem to trigger this idea of going into G0. So for example, your skin cells, you are constantly replacing your skin cells because they get old and they fluff off because your skin is born at one layer and then it moves up to the top layers and you lose layers of skin cells. So your skin cells don't really go into G0. They're constantly going through uh, mitosis in order to replenish those new skin cell layers. So different cells have different ways that they regulate whether or not they go into G1 and G0. So one way that we control this is through the telomere length. After you have gone through so many divisions, then we stop going through the cell cycle and we leave you in G0 until you get old and have to be replaced. <clears throat> Another way that we control the cell cycle is through specific genes, through specific genes. <clears throat> One type of gene is what we call a proto-oncogene. There are certain genes that we call proto-oncogenes. Proto-oncogenes, these are normal genes that act to speed up the cell cycle. And if you're following along, this is where I'm on um, page 143. or um, slide number 31. Mm, slide number 31. Okay. Proto-oncogenes. They act to stimulate cell division. Probably the most famous, <clears throat> and this is not in your book, so make sure you write this down. Probably the most famous proto-oncogene is called the P51 gene. So if you are looking for a topic for your cell, for your oral presentation for lab, the P51 gene, there is so much information on it. It is a very well-studied proto-oncogene. 
everybody has a P51 gene. You've got one, I've got one. We all have a P51 gene. Its job is to encourage the cell to move through the stages of the cell cycle. The P51 gene produces what we call a growth factor. And the growth factor, this is basically a chemical that encourages cells to go from G1 to S to G2 to prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. So it's the job of that growth factor to encourage the cell to move from one stage to the next within the cell cycle. This is normal, this is healthy, and it happens all the time you need it in order for your cells to replace each other as they're supposed to. Sometimes, <clears throat> and if you remember when we were doing um, transcription and translation, we did that activity where we said it's maybe a gene is mutated Sometimes proto-oncogenes like P51 can get damaged. When there is damage to a gene, then we say the gene has been mutated. And the mutation means that we change the DNA sequence. So for example, maybe the sequence is supposed to be A, T, C, G, T, T, A, but something happened, this is normal, something happened and we changed the sequence to let's say A, T, C, and then it became C, A, A, G. We changed this last part of it. And so that's important because if this is our gene, you remember that that's going to impact our mRNA. So our mRNA is going to look different. Now our mRNA is going to be um, U, A, G, C, A, A, U. Whereas this mRNA is going to be U, A, G, G, U, U. C. Okay. It's going to change the last part and that ultimately can impact the protein. And we might end up with a different protein than what we were supposed to get normally. So when a damaged proto-oncogene is mutated, we change the name. Damaged <clears throat> or mutated proto-oncogenes are called oncogenes. They're called oncogenes. And oncogenes do not work the same way as proto-oncogenes. Oncogenes, they over encourage cells. They basically, they turn up the volume or you can say they turn on the accelerator and cells go through the cell cycle too quickly. If that happens, that's what we call oncogenesis. And oncogenesis is the beginning of cancer.
Oops, I misspelled it. Oncogenesis. There we go. Oncogenesis. Or the beginning, the onset of cancer. So proto-oncogenes are normal and healthy, but oncogenes, these are cells that are not healthy or on, not cells, they are genes that are not healthy. And we basically turned on the accelerator. And so we start to overproduce growth factors. How are we doing so far? Are you keeping up with me okay? A little behind. A little behind. So type a number one into the chat window when I can go on to the next page. Yeah. All right, <clears throat> so we've talked about one type of gene, one type of gene that can be involved in regulating um, the cell cycle. Here's a second type of gene. This is also on your slideshow, but the second type of gene that could be involved in regulating the cell cycle is what are called tumor suppressor genes. Ah, suppressor. There we go, tumor suppressor genes. Now the role of healthy tumor suppressor genes, okay, their job, so we'll say normal healthy TSPs, TSGs as we call them, TSGs, okay. Normal healthy tumor suppressor genes, they are kind of like a braking system. They slow down the cell cycle. So if you can think of proto-oncogenes, they like accelerate the cell cycle, but tumor suppressor genes, they slow down the cell cycle so that cells don't go too fast. We want cells to go through the cell cycle at the right rate. It's kind of like there's a speed limit, you know. We want you to go somewhere between 50 and 55. 60 is too fast. 40s too slow. So between these two sets of genes, one of them speeds it up and the other one slows it down so that together they make sure that you're passing through the cell cycle at the right pace. However, if these get mutated, then they don't these TSGs, these tumor suppressor genes, then they don't regulate at all. They allow the cell cycle to pass through without any breaks.
So if they are mutated, then these tumor suppressor genes they don't put any breaking system on there. And so the cell progresses without any slowdown. Um, if you are looking for an example of a tumor suppressor gene, there's something called the RAS gene. This is also a well-studied tumor suppressor gene. Uh, the RAS gene is uh, known for basically a breaking system for cells going through the cell cycle. If the RAS gene is mutated, then there is no breaking system. It's not the only tumor suppressor gene, but it's one of the many different examples of tumor suppressor genes. So cancer itself, it's a multi-event disease. Lots of things have to go wrong before you can actually um, develop cancer. <clears throat> Lots of things have to go wrong. So you have to go wrong with the system that manages the telomeres. You have to go wrong with the proto-oncogenes and you have to go wrong with the tumor suppressor genes. So the telomeres are not managed. Proto-oncogenes are mutated. And then your tumor suppressor genes are also mutated. By the way, this is a short list. I could keep adding to this list, but I want you to get the idea that it's a multi-event disease. Lots of things have to go wrong in order for cancer to actually um, develop. What could cause this plus any of the other things that I'm leaving off the list, what could cause that to happen? What could cause us to not manage our telama, telomeres? What could cause us to mutate our oncogenes? Um, what could cause us to mutate our tumor suppressor genes? Well, that list is also a very long list. So we'll ask it this way what could be considered a mutagenic or an oncogenic event. Remember that mutagen is something that changes your DNA, whereas oncogenic actually starts cancer. You can change your DNA, but not be a cancer causing agent. Some things are both, some things are just one by themselves. One thing that we know is that there is something called a telomerase. It's an enzyme. That's why I'm underlining the ASE. Okay, it's an enzyme. But telomerases, um, they are able to build or able to manage your telomeres. So if something mismanages those telomerases, in some cases, they rebuild shortened telomeres. And that sounds like a good thing, but it's not always a good thing. Because remember that long telomeres mean that you're young and short telomeres mean that you're old. Well, cancer cells are immortal. They're forever young. And so this is one of the ways that cancer cells stay young is that they rebuild telometers. In other words, cancer cells don't die like they're supposed to because they keep rebuilding the telomeres that should be shortening, causing 
or at least leading to their eventual death. So this is not always a good thing to have longer telomeres. We also know that exposure to certain chemicals they can cause mutations in our DNA. So things like UV light, I don't think it's um, something that people don't understand or at least that they don't know that thing like sunburns, many, many sunburns over the course of your lifetime can cause skin cancer because the energy in the sunlight can literally damage your DNA at the skin level. Uh, exposure to things like cigarette smoke. Uh oh, cigarette smoke. Cigarette smoke over the course of a lifetime can also constantly introduce chemicals into your lungs, which can lead to lung cancer. Exposure to things like asbestos. Exposure to um, gasoline vapors and other solvents over the course of a lifetime can constantly introduce chemicals into your system, which can eventually cause cancer. There's also even evidence that some of the things that they put into our foods are cancer causing agents. You've probably heard that certain dyes such as red dye number, I don't know what color or what number the red dye is up to but red dye uh, most commonly added to things like hot dogs to give them a pretty color that they look uh, you know, appealing. Um, red dye is a food additive that has been implicated as being a possible cancer causing agent. We also know though that exposure to certain environmental hazards such as conditions where you have um, a high rate of pollution, just in general. So like we can look at people that live in very congested cities as compared to live, people that live in rural areas like we do. People that live in highly congested cities with a lot of pollution are more likely to develop cancers, certain types of cancers than people that live out in rural areas where there's not a lot of pollution. So there's a lot of incidents that could actually lead up to one of these or more situations which can cause cancer to result. Unless it's a super big event, most things require a lifetime of exposure for it to actually develop cancer. Oh, I forgot one. I forgot one, number four, certain bacterial and viral infections are known to be cancer causing agents. So certain types of bacterial and certain types of viral infections are known to be cancer causing agents. So again, um, it's not like if you get a one-time exposure to cigarette smoke, you will get cancer. It's not like you get a, you know, you accidentally smell some gasoline vapors when you're putting gasoline in your car, you will get vapors, uh, you will get cancer. It's almost always a lifetime of exposure, or you could have a one-time event exposure that is so humongous that it has a serious impact. Like, for example, um, most of you are probably too, remember, too young to remember in the 80s there was a nuclear waste plant in Russia that had a meltdown and the nuclear waste plant released a tremendous amount of energy. The name of the place was Chernobyl. And so again, if you're looking for a if you're looking for a topic for your oral presentation, uh, the nuclear waste plant accident that happened in Chernobyl, Russia, and the effects today. If you can imagine, it would be like if 
something happened in Albuquerque, let's say something happened at um, UNM in Albuquerque, and a tremendous amount of radiation was released so that everybody between Albuquerque and Artesia, we had to clear that out of people. There is a 200 mile radius around the city of Chernobyl. And Chernobyl itself was not a very big city. I think it might have been about the size of Portales, maybe 12,000 people, if that big. Might have been, you know, maybe even a little smaller than Artesia. But the events that happened at Chernobyl were so significant that everybody that lived within a 200 mile radius of Chernobyl had to get up and leave. They had to move. And even to this day, there is a fence around that 200 mile radius of Chernobyl where only wildlife have been allowed in. People are not allowed to go into what they call the hot zone around Chernobyl because there are still um, impacts of radiation that are detectable to this day. So that's kind of an example of a one-time mega event that is so huge that it could cause problems. Um, the events of Chernobyl were so significant that many people developed very bizarre types of cancers and died. Those that didn't die, um, if they were healthy enough to reproduce, they still saw the effects of the uh, radiation event in their children. What's even crazy is even today, there are cases of um, discrimination against people who are known to have ties to Chernobyl like maybe their mom and dad live there or they're the granddaughter of somebody from Chernobyl because it's thought that their DNA, even several generations later, is still impacted. Isn't that so crazy? Bizarro. One of the things I wanted to point out that's in your textbook, um, I wish it was, I don't have a slideshow of it, but in your textbook is they spend a little bit of time talking about lung cancer. And I wanna show these two graphs from your textbook, which talk about lung cancer, males versus females. For many years, when you would look at a package of cigarettes, you would see a warning on the side of the package that said, warning, smoking may cause cancer. Now the warning has changed that it says, smoking does cause cancer. That was a huge landmark case in the US court system where we were able to change the wording of that warning from may cause cancer to does cause cancer, mostly because the tobacco industry did not want to be liable or responsible for people using their product and then develop, eventually developing lung cancer. Cigarette smoke is one of the worst pollutants that you can expose yourself to. There are something like 50 known chemicals and then there are still some unknown chemicals in regular cigarette smoke. And here's an example of some data that helped contribute to changing that warning. I'm not sure, let me see if I can put this up a little bit higher and maybe it'll come out easier for you to read. Let me elevate this just a little more. There we go, that looks a little clearer. But this is in your book on page um, 145 of your textbook. It's not on the slideshow. But here's what I wanna share with you. This is over time, so from 1900s to roughly 2010, and this is per capita cigarette consumption for males. So <clears throat> cigarette consumption, it increased significantly during World War I, World War II, the Korean War. Um, if you're following along historic events, this blue line here is how cigarette consumption increased from basically 1900 to around 1960. This is before we really began to examine um, how lung cancer was associated with cigarette consumption. Here, the red line, this is the rate of lung cancer deaths over that same time period. It's interesting that these two lines, they match each other in terms of when this began to increase the consumption, then just a few years later, we saw the lung cancer deaths also increase match for match. 
Remember, why aren't these on top of each other? Because it takes time for cancer to develop. Also, someone who was born in 1910 may not have started smoking cigarettes until about 1930. And so these you know, represent data over somebody's lifetime, but we certainly see a correlation between lung cancer deaths and the increased usage of cigarettes. What we can also see is that as cigarette consumption declined, so did the rate of lung cancer deaths. Is it any better for women? The answer is not really. What we seem to see is that fewer females consume cigarettes overall. So the graph is not as extreme as the previous graph. However, it still took about 30 years for the rate of lung cancer deaths to catch up with the increase in cigarette consumption. So we know now that there's a definite correlation between those two. And the Surgeon General, which is kind of like the top doctor in the United States, has finally acknowledged or forced um, cigarette companies to acknowledge that cigarette consumption not may cause cancer, but will cause cancer. And so they've changed that warning on the cigarette box in order to kind of correlate with that. I am out of time. Do you have any questions for me? Oh. All right then. So as I mentioned today, um, we have just very few lectures left. We have our last regular lab this week. So Nancy, I'll see you for lab. Yes, ma'am. I'll see you for lab. The rest of you, I will see on Thursday for lab. You guys have a nice afternoon. You too, ma'am. You too.